Hello, and welcome to the Friedman Archives blog. Today we're going to talk about the 10 best and 10 worst Minolta cameras ever made. This here is my personal collection. You may wonder, why do I keep so many obsolete cameras lying around? Fact is, my wife wonders the same thing. But the fact is, I can't get rid of these. They're all an extension of me. They all have such sentimental value. Every one of these represents a trip I took or a part of my life that just brings back fond memories. There's something about cameras and photographers that just make them inseparable. The camera is your constant companion. It's an extension out of your mind. If you take some time to get to know it, you can work very quickly with it. It's like an, uh, a soldier with his gun or a, a Jedi master with his lightsaber. It's, it's a part of you. Anyway, number one. This is a venerable SRT-202. A classic in anybody's mind. A purely mechanical camera from the 1960s, it's identical in design to the even more famous SRT-101. They just made a couple minor engineering changes. Best thing about this camera is you can use it in Siberia in the winter time. It's a purely mechanical camera. All of the energy for the mirror and for the shutter and for closing the f-stop comes in the winding of the film. The only battery that's there is on the bottom and is there to move a match needle. There's a needle inside that lets you know when your f-stop and shutter speed combination are right for the amount of light. But if that battery little dies, you can still set your f-stop and shutter speed manually, either using the Sunny F16 rule or using a handheld light meter, and you can still work in the worst of conditions. The other nice thing about this camera is if you're a fan of old adding machines, mechanical anything, this has such a satisfying kerchunk associated with it. Listen to that. Ah. Anyway, number two. Once upon a time, Minolta decided, you know what, let's go out to the professional market. We don't know what to make, but we know what professionals already use. They use the Nikon F2AS. So why not make a camera that's a complete knockoff of that? And that's what this is here. This is a Minolta XK, which also goes by the name XM or X1, depending on the country. This camera is exactly the same design as a Nikon F2. You can remove the pincer prism like this. This is where the metering occurs. You can remove the focusing screen and replace it with one of your own or one with a different grid. All the design mistakes that Nikon made, Minolta made too. For example, if you want to reassociate the pentaprism with a camera, you have to reset this little pin here, which is used to read the f-stop. Never occurred to anybody to do it a more reasonable way. However, Nikon had a disadvantage. It was a match needle camera, just like the SRT-101 and 202. Minolta did them one better. Let's make an aperture preferred camera. So all you have to do is set the f-stop and the camera using this little computer in here will set the shutter speed for you. So this was the best, most advanced professional camera in the world when it was introduced in 1978. A classic. Now, if you're a sports photographer, you can't just keep winding the film. There's no way to put a motor drive on here. What do you do? You spring for the $10,000 XK motor, a behemoth. This has the motor part permanently attached to the body. You cannot remove it. And if you want to actually have it go at the blistering three and a half frames per second this camera was capable of, you have to attach the battery pack underneath. This takes 10 AA batteries. Camera weighs a ton. If you ever went to a photographer's convention, you always knew who the XK motor shooters were because they were the ones walking around like this. <clears throat> anyway. Once upon a time, Minolta and Leica were very close. And Minolta was designing cameras that, alike, that Leica would eventually use and modify for their own uses. Hey, Leica, why don't you take this and make this the basis of your R-series? It's a real heavy professional camera. And Leica looked at Minolta's lineup and said, eh, I think we'll go for this instead. This is a much more practical body. This is the XE7. That was the U.S. designation. It works just like the XK I just showed you. The only difference is the pentaprism is not removable. It's fixed. But everything else about it is quite nice. The controls are much more readily accessible. The shutter is much more advanced and a lot quieter. So this was the basis of the R3 and the R3 MOT, which stands for motor. Very, very good industrial strength camera. Probably the best classic Minolta camera ever made for manual focus was this. It goes by several different names. 
Here it's the XD11. In Europe it was the XD7. But the idea was for a manual focus camera, this was the first one that offered both shutter priority and aperture priority. And it was teensy weensy, which fit with the camera design ethos of the time. Make everything small, like the Olympus OM-1 or the Pentax ME. Remember those cameras? This, Minolta advertised as having a silky smooth shutter. Two reasons why that is. The first is a newly designed shutter, which doesn't go left and right like the SRT202 did. It goes up and down. This actually makes for a faster flash sync speed. It also means less spring action tension is necessary to get the shutter to go from top to bottom. But there's another thing this camera does which is responsible for its very Lexus-like behavior. Because these lenses were not designed for automation, usually whenever the camera stops down a lens, it'll move this pin. But when they were designing the lenses back in the 1960, there was no consideration of automation back then. If you move this pin a certain amount on one lens, it will close down the f-stop blades a different amount from one lens to another. So there's no way for the camera to know, how do I stop this down to f8 if I want to? How did Minolta solve the problem? Well, what they did was they kind of guessed. Move the pin a little bit to stop down the lens a little bit. It should be in the right range. Then meter for the amount of light that's coming in set the shutter speed appropriately, and then lift your mirror and move the shutter. So what's happening is, many things are happening out of sequence, not all at once. And that actually makes for a much smoother operating experience. A classic. A classic. Time for game changing. Only the human eye focuses faster. This was the Maxim 9000 camera. Best camera in the world when it was introduced in 1988. Autofocus, the second autofocus camera they ever made, because it was designed for professionals, professionals wouldn't trust it, right? So you have an automatic, uh, you have the motor drive on the bottom if you want, but if you're worried about reliability, you can still wind the film by yourself. This was a very, very cool camera. In fact, I took this camera to my very first trip to the Soviet Union back in 1988. And I was kind of smug back then because, uh, well, back in 1988, this was state-of-the-art for the Soviet Union. Ladies and gentlemen, meet the Zenit. It has a top speed of a 500th of a second. It has automatic exposure. Well, not automatic. This light sensor here will deflect a needle that's not in the viewfinder, but it's on the top panel. So you can look and match the needles up here, read your f-stop and shutter speed combinations off the dial. Set your f-stop, set your shutter speed, and if your uh, sports action shot hasn't moved or gone home yet, you can still take the shot. Now, when I was in the Soviet Union, I was kind of very good. Huh, look at my camera. I got the state-of-the-art, best in the world, blah, 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 blah. But this one could be used in Siberia in the wintertime. Mine couldn't. <laughs> There's another really cool feature about this camera, and that is the program back Super 90, which was an optional data back, but in addition to be able to print information on the film in a little tiny corner, it would also allow you to take control of the automatic exposure in ways that the camera normally wouldn't allow you to do. For example, you can specify how the program mode would work if you want to favor high shutter speeds in certain examples, uh, in certain situations, for example. Or if you want to turn the camera into an Olympus OM-4, and Olympus OM-4 was a 1970s era camera. It had a multiple spot meter reading. So all you had to do was take a spot meter here at your brightest, your darkest, your 18% grayest. It would average all the readings together and that would be your final exposure. It was great for tricky lighting situations and this data back would allow you to do the same thing. So that was a good idea. The problem is their implementation was kind of substandard. The buttons were fidgety. In order to turn that feature on and off, you had to press all of these squishy buttons, about six of them, before you can get the feature you want on or off. And I just found it annoying. So I made two personal modifications. This was back in the days when I would take things apart and just make things to my own specifications. First thing I did, I don't know if you can see it, I raised the buttons. Hard to do because I haven't found the glue yet that actually sticks to silicon but it's there and I can feel it. So one button for exposure clear and one button for take a reading, take a reading, take a reading. The other one was this switch over here. 
I open it up and install this switch. When the switch is up, the data back takes over. When the switch is down, the camera takes over. This way, you don't have to worry about pressing these six squishy buttons in order to turn a feature on and off. You can work very, very quickly out in the field. This is a professional's dream. Very, very reliable. If this was reliable, this was even better. This was the Minolta Maxim 9. And if you thought the Minolta XK was heavy, well, this is about in the same league. It was designed by the marketing department who did marketing surveys and they decided what do professionals want? Well, professionals want a machine gun. Mach professionals want something that's really big and heavy and, 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 and built like a tank. That's what this is. Incredibly reliable, weather sealed, five and a half frames per second. This should have gotten no end of design awards because after all, Nikon copied this design when they came out with the F5. However, in the mainstream media, this camera got nothing but disrespect. Why? Because it's got a pop-up flash. And if you're in the mainstream media, everybody knows that professional cameras do not have a pop-up flash. Therefore, I'm writing this off, which is really a shame. This was a workhorse. When I was shooting weddings in a big way, I would have one of these and one of these with me. I actually preferred this one. This was the camera successor, a Maxim 7. Maxim 7 was made out of plastic instead of metal. It was much lighter. It had a top frame speed of about four frames per second instead of five and a half. Big deal. The user interface on this camera was infinitely superior, due largely in part to the liquid crystal display in the back. Instead of having to carry a card with you to figure out what does this custom function do and how do I do this, everything is spelled out for you right there. There's even a nice, a very nice feature. Uh, don't forget, this is film-based camera, not digital, so you can't have instant feedback when you take your picture. So if you want to take a reading, you hit your AEL button, and then you can press a button on the back, and you can see what the 14-cell honeycomb metering pattern shows you for the lightness distribution of your shot. You can know in an instant, is anything going to blow out or not? you got rings here to show you at a glance what your settings are for your drive mode. You can have your flash exposure compensation and your exposure compensation on the same knob. This, this, I could work faster with this than anything. In fact, the design for this camera was so good ergonomically that when it came time to make a digital SLR, Minolta pretty much lifted the Maxim 7 design and came out with this, which is the Maxim 7D. Same layout. 6 megapixel camera. This is one of the best user interfaces ever to grace a modern SLR or DSLR. And I'll show you how it works right now, except that this camera is suffering from the dreaded first frame black problem and it costs $250 to fix and uh, I can put that money to better use. Last one for this table, one of my favorite travel cameras ever. This actually preceded the 7D. This was the Kanaka Minolta A1-A2. It was the first camera ever to introduce anti-shake. And it was also one of the first cameras to have an articulating screen for a professional one. When they made this camera, the Minolta engineers decided, you know what, let's throw out convention. You don't need mirrors anymore. You don't need shutters anymore. What can we do to rethink the camera? First thing you do, they started from the sensor and worked backwards. The sensor was about that big. So they made a lens, a very, very good lens, that whose image circle just fits the sensor. So right off the top of the bat, the camera is smaller and the lens is smaller. Because the lens is permanently attached, no chance of dust getting into the sealed chamber. The articulating screen is like, and you also have an articulating EVF. So this is like a predecessor for the modern A55, A77. And this would still be my favorite travel camera. After all, at low ISOs, the image quality is just superb. Anything greater than ISO 100, though, it's kind of noisy because, you know, your sensor is that big. But I'd be using the NEX7 right now as my favorite travel camera if only Sony would send it to me. I've had mine on order since October. <clears throat> There's two other honorable mentions for the best Minolta's ever made. I don't have them here, but I can tell you about them. The first one, for you Leica Rangefinder fans, was the Minolta CLE. It was actually a camera designed to take the vast majority of the Leica M mount lenses. So if you had really good glass, you could mount it right here. Biggest differences between the Minolta CLE and the Leica M series rangefinders was that the CLE had aperture preferred metering. You set the f-stop, it was set to shutter speed for you. In addition, it also had 
uh, automatic exposure flash, something that would take Leica about 20 years before they offered the same thing in their very high-end camera bodies. The other one was a pioneering digital camera. It was the RD175. It was a 1.75 megapixel DSLR. Now, big deal. However, back in those days, you couldn't get a sensor that was large enough or with enough pixels to make it worthwhile. So Minolta took a very clever approach. They would take three CCDs from video cameras, tiny ones, and put three of them inside the camera. And in front of the lens, and back of the lens, they would have a beam splitter. The red would go to this CCD, the blue would go to that CCD, and the green would go to the middle CCD. It would take all the information together and stitch it together into one cohesive red, green, blue array, and that's how you would manage to get a high-resolution sensor at a reasonable price. The crop factor was insane, and it was rather large. It was built on the Minolta um, 404 SI body, but it was still, for its day, an advanced camera. So those are, in my opinion, the best Minolta cameras ever made. Now, to balance things out, it would make sense to offer the 10 worst which we will do next time.